we may be joined by other people, uh, but first of all, we'd like to welcome you, and we're calling the meeting to order officially at 4.31. Uh, this is actually a training session, and we want it to be of an opportunity for all of us that are here, uh, counselors and other people who have come um, to make sure that you get all of your questions answered about open meeting law, about public records and conflict of interest law, and frankly, if there's anything else. So as soon as we kind of get settled, we're gonna have everybody introduce themselves, counselors and all, and then I'm going to also invite the counselors to sit with the rest of the audience uh, because Lauren is gonna be standing up here pacing back and forth like she does. And um, that way you can join in watching either way. You're also welcome to stay here if you wanna take notes. Okay? And watch your back. And watch her back, <laughs> right. Got your back, Lauren. Um, so, uh, let's start by asking our friends in the audience to introduce themselves. And what brings you here? Great. Great. We'll get to Lauren in a moment. We have two, three people now here from our town. Um, Athena? Hi. Four Paul, Paul Bachman, town manager. Sean Hannon, IT. Sean Hannon, IT. <laughs> Can't get the microphone working? It's okay, Sean. Let me show you the button. Um, it's the way to confuse okay. me. It's, it's really nice to be kind of able to be a little more relaxed than normal. Um, Brianna, introduce yourself. Hello. Hello, Brianna Sunrud, IT. Okay, and then using the microphones as we go around, starting with Darcy. Don't forget to press. <laughs> I'm Darcy Dumont, District 5 Counselor. Andy Steinberg, Counselor at Large. Mandy Johanneke, Counselor at Large. Pat DeAngelis, District 2 Counselor. Sarah Swartz, District 1 Counselor. Lynn Griesmer, District 2 Counselor and Council Town Council President. Kathy Shane, District 1. Shalini Bahelmel, District 5. Okay. And we have a couple more people who have joined us. And so we're going to put you on the spot and ask you to introduce yourself and tell us your affiliation with town boards and so forth. Gentlemen in the back. Great. Okay. So our guest this evening and our expert is Lauren Goldberg uh, with KP Law. She serves as our town attorney and she has been pummeled with uh, questions clarifying the charter since the day we all started and comes to us tonight as a serious resource on this whole thing. So we're going to project on both screens. What we're going to start is asking you what questions do you want to make sure we answer on the issue of open meeting? Raise your hand. Yes, sir. Great. Yes, you should repeat it because should not Amherst Media. Ah, I'm sorry, Amherst Media is recording this, so we'd like to have you live on TV. Uh, either that or you can take the mic from Brianna. 
Okay, um, Steve George, Board of Health. My question about the open meeting is, to what extent are we limited in email exchanges outside of the meeting itself? Obviously, we can't discuss serious policy and how, how, what we're gonna do, but how about distributing information that is useful to the other members of the committee and that kind of thing? Thank you. These are, what we're trying to do at this point is collect questions about the open meeting law. Sir, Brianna will help you. Steve um, The thing I thought was most ambiguous was what is deliberation? So what is deliberation? What is deliberation? More okay. clarification on that. Okay. Additional questions? Andy Steinberg. Just want to make sure that uh, somehow we touch on the question of uh, participation in social media and the risks and how to avoid the risks of um, open meeting law violations with social media participation, either if it's a counselor's social media page or participation in somebody else's page. So with that, should we add what is the definition of social media for this purpose? Okay. Kathy? Is this on already? Um, just building on the question about distributing information, if we've got a draft of minutes and we share them offline and people are saying there's a typo, there's a missing word, can we copy the other people or can we just do it to the drafter, you know, to, so other people understand we've already read it closely. So it's that kind of corrections in minutes. Additional questions that we want to make sure we get. Shalini? So we, have, we formed a new town council, and I was wondering what are ways for the town council members to get to know each other uh, while, you know, um, respecting the open meeting law? Okay. Other questions about open meeting? Okay, I'm sure that other questions are gonna arise, and we're gonna do the same thing as we go into public records, uh, conflict of interest, the ethics law, if you will. But right now, we're gonna do a brief, Lauren's gonna do a brief presentation, and there will be additional questions, I'm sure, that will arise with that. So, Lauren, the floor is yours. Thank you for, yes, thank you to you, Madam Chair. Um, well, good afternoon or early evening, whichever it is. Um, I feel a little bit like I'm on Jeopardy. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie. Um, because, you know, what is, whatever. Anyway, um, I'm gonna try and talk about, oh, I'm gonna try and talk about what these issues are um, on a case by case and weave into it the other things about the open meeting law that really inform these answers. So. The first is, what are limits on email correspondence? Oh, well, I should actually back up one step. I started my legal career uh, in 1996 at the Secretary of State's Public Records Division, and then I moved over to the uh, Secretary of State's Elections Division after that. Um, even there, I was dealing with public records open meeting issues, and um, since 2000, I've been at KP Law, where I deal with this kind of stuff every day. So I am going to try and talk about best practices that might be different than what your actual practice is. Um, it doesn't mean that what you do is actually illegal if it's not a best practice. But it's certainly easier to um, defend a challenge when best practices are used. Now, the other thing is that when we are um, looking at why these things matter, why does it make a difference? Why does the open meeting law matter? Why does the public records law matter? And why does the conflict of interest law matter? The reason they matter is because, obviously, transparency in government. That's number one, right? But number two is the work that you all do is very important work. And we want that work to be able to be defended if it's challenged. And if it's challenged, we don't want to focus on things like, was there an email that violated the open meeting law? Instead, we want to focus on what are what was the legal, or what was the decision you made, and was it justified? Was it supportable? So, um, you know, we don't want to be asking, oh, did that person have a friendship with this person, and that's why this and that? 
No, we don't want to do that. And we also don't want to be saying, well, there was a piece of paper that laid that out, but we don't know where that is anymore. So those are the types of things that people raise when they're looking to challenge boards and committees' work um, and, and individuals' work. And so if we're trying to make the work, what you're actually doing, the focus, we try to have best practices with respect to these items, okay? Um, everybody makes mistakes, um, but you can definitely, with the, with the open meeting law, it's easy to learn from them um, and to cure them as long as they're not intentional, which um, most of the time they are not. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is emails. So why do emails implicate the open meeting law? And the answer to that is because anytime a quorum of members of a particular board or committee are addressing a matter within their jurisdiction, whether it's by email, whether it's in person, altogether, whether it's um, serially, so one person calls another, calls another, um, or an email gets forwarded, anytime you get to a quorum and it's dealing with a matter within that body's jurisdiction, it constitutes a meeting for purposes of the open meeting law. Okay? Now, the question, and I'm gonna jump around a tiny bit, what is deliberation? Well, that matters because you can't violate the open meeting law if you're not deliberating, okay? So, is there a limit on email correspondence relative to matters that are within the board's jurisdiction? Absolutely, or a board's jurisdiction. Anything substantive about which you have feelings, ideas, beliefs, or concerns should happen at the table or the long row of seats um, and not by email or in a coffee shop or on the telephone, okay? So anything substantive where that's within the board's jurisdiction that's shared between a quorum of members constitutes a deliberation. Now there are some exceptions to what a meeting is, okay? So that constitutes a deliberation at a meeting. Now maybe you didn't post that meeting right and we'll talk about posting separately. Okay, you have a meeting that hasn't been posted. How do we fix that? Well, we come to a meeting that's properly posted and we discuss it at that time, okay? Um, but what if we're doing other things? What if we're, you know, the, the Paul wants to send the council um, a scheduling email. Let's meet on these days about this and these days about that. It's not a violation to email amongst a quorum, okay? What it is not okay to do is talk about your feelings, ideas, beliefs, and concerns. And the example that I like to use of this is, let's say Paul sends out an email, hypothetically, that says, uh, let's meet next Thursday on whatever. Does that work for people? And one person writes back, oh, Thursday's no good, Tuesday's not this, Wednesday's fine. This, all of that is fine. But then someone says in this email chain, it's imperative we meet as soon as possible. This is very important. Now we have an open meeting law problem. Feelings, ideas, beliefs, and concerns shared amongst a quorum about a matter within the board's jurisdiction. Um, what does the AG say about email? Don't. Okay, um, that's what the AG says. If you, the only thing you should could do by email is schedule, okay? Um, and even then you have to be really smart. Now, an individual member of a board can email the chair and say, you know, Madam Chairperson, could you please include the following item on the agenda? That is not a violation. You're requesting an item be included on the agenda. But if it goes on to say, and it's copied to everyone else, because I feel I think I believe da da da, now we're heading down a problem path under the open meeting law. If the individual counselor or an individual board member emails the chair and doesn't copy anyone else, they're not prohibited from sharing their feelings, ideas, beliefs, and concerns, except if it's a three-member board. But it starts creating risk, okay? Well-meaning board member sends it to another well-meaning board member who sends it to a third. Now that's a violation if it's a five-member board because three members now know feelings, ideas, beliefs, and concerns. So as soon as you get to a quorum, you've created a violation if you share your feelings, ideas, beliefs, and concerns. The more email there is, the more risk there is that feelings, ideas, and beliefs, and concerns will reach a quorum. Um, I think I, I might have said this the last time I was here, but I'm just going to say it again. Um, when I first came to the firm in 2000, I went with one of the um, founding partners to do a training, and 
as I'm sitting there listening to her, she starts saying, and you're, it's absolutely illegal to talk about anything on the agenda outside of a meeting. It's not allowed under the open meeting law. And I was thinking to myself, she's wrong, that's not true. You know, why would she say that? And so when we left, I said, you know, why did you say that? And she said, because if you tell them they can talk outside of the meeting, they're all gonna violate the law. They don't mean to. But it was funny at the time until I, it is very tempting we are used to, especially elected officials and appointed officials who sought out appointment because they have strong feelings about things, to then be in a situation where they have to regulate sharing those feelings. So feelings, ideas, beliefs, and concerns, your perspective, you can only share at a table or amongst less than a quorum, at a table at a properly posted meeting, or amongst less than a quorum. And if it's less than a quorum, there's a risk. And the risk is, even if you read it and you don't press forward, you just talk to somebody else. Let's say it's a five-member board. You know, you send me an email. I agree with you. I think it's smart. I see you on the street, and I say, hey, the two of us, we think blah, blah, blah. Now that's a quorum, okay? Now that's an open meeting law violation. Even though you didn't know, and even though I told you I wasn't meaning to violate the law, let's say, but the fact of sharing that information constitutes a violation. When you are emailing information for a meeting, and that was a, I don't know, if, do, you, do you want to ask a question first? Are you sure? Okay. So if you're emailing information related to a meeting, Paul or your staff person can email whatever they would like that they've created. They can share, the staff can share their feelings, ideas, beliefs, and concerns. They can prepare a recommended decision memo. They can prepare an, an, a, you know, a recommended policy memo. They can explain all the reasons why they think it's a good idea, a bad idea, et cetera, okay? If you're a board member, you cannot do that. You can't share your own feelings, ideas, beliefs, and concerns with a quorum of the board. If you share your position, that's deemed to be a deliberation under the open meeting law. So if I was asked for a legal opinion and I either send that directly to the council or I send it to Paul and Paul sends it to the council, that's fine. But if one of you know, the counselors have a legal opinion of their own or an opinion of their own, them then sharing it in response, she's completely wrong, I disagree. That is sharing the ideas, feelings, beliefs, and concerns amongst a quorum, can't do it, okay? Now, again, I said this is a best practices because the risk creeps in as soon as you move along. Now, if you found something on the web that you think is critical to the committee's understanding about something, and you want to send it to them, you can, because you didn't write it. But you can't say, because this is just how I see it, because I really agree with this writer, because they really stated it just the way I would. You could just say, um, this re relates to our meeting on Monday. Okay. Now, sometimes people will put uh, a disclosure at the end of an email when they do that that says, this is not for discussion now, it's for discussion at Tuesday's meeting. Um, staff people will sometimes say, uh, please do not reply to all. If you have concerns, let me know. So you wanna be conscious of that. If you're sending an email, that you're taking steps to avoid implicating the, the conflict of interest. Public records law, conflict of interest, one of them. Um, so an email about a schedule is okay. It's actually exempt in the statute. An email of something you didn't prepare is okay. It's not your feelings, ideas, beliefs, and concerns. But an email amongst a quorum about individual members' ideas, beliefs, and concerns is a violation. All right? So the AG, as I said, the AG's recommendation is just don't email except for, um, except for scheduling. And sure, that makes a lot of sense from a you know, strict view of the, of, the, of the law, but it may not be an accurate view of the world. Um, how do we make sure that if there's emails amongst members, we hold on to them, that they actually exist? And we use the town email addresses for that. Everyone has one? Volunteers? Yeah. Everybody uses that, and that way, your emails are saved on the system, on the, the town's backup, and if you wind up, okay, yep. Just, just clarify that. All the counselors do and all staff do volunteer representatives on, say, the Board of Health or something, they do not. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. So one thing that you can do to um, create, ensure that you're creating a record that can be searched and easily find, and these laws do kind of 
interrelate, so this is under the public records law, is to copy a town address. So whether it's a town staff person or a, an address that's specifically created to kind of be a, a, a repository for the, um, for the emails that you sent. Okay? Now, um, I just also want to just reiterate what staff can do so that there's no questions about that. Staff can share their feelings, share their opinions, share their beliefs, share facts, give updates. They can do whatever they would like. Okay? The problem becomes if someone reacts to it and sends it back to everybody. So let's say um, Paul sends out a, an update X, Y, and Z, and someone writes back, reply to all, I have serious concerns about this. Now that's an open meeting law issue. If that person just wrote back directly to Paul, that's not an open meeting law issue because only one person, Paul, knows about it. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. What is deliberation? I think you guys can tell me. What is it? Sharing feelings, ideas, beliefs, and concerns about a matter within the board's jurisdiction. Um, so a lot of times I'll be asked, well, we don't actually have jurisdiction over X, Y, or Z. That means we can talk about it, right? Really, the answer is still no, and the bigger the jurisdiction, the less likely it's outside of your jurisdiction. So let's just take um, uh, a really important project in town. Now, the council may not be involved in permitting that, but it's a really important project, and the council is going to have to appropriate the money and blah, blah, blah. So you can see these things interrelate in some ways. And even though it might not be there, if it's appealed, then it'll be the board. So. These are the types of things where, if it relates to town business, you should assume that it's within your jurisdiction. Um, what might not be within the jurisdiction? Um, you know, somebody's kid is gonna uh, be in a play and the parent's trying to drum up a lot of uh, attendance for their show, okay? That, if there's emails about that, that's not gonna violate the open meeting law because it's not town business, all right? Um, okay. so. Participation in social media and avoiding risks. Uh, this is the new frontier. So um, it is only within the last nine years that that email was actually recognized by the law as being subject to the open meeting law. Okay, so we've had email around for a very long time, and almost all of the district attorney's offices who were then enforcing the law were responsible for um, and, and believed that email would fall within the open meeting law. But there was one that didn't. I forget which one it was. And so there was this debate, you know, everywhere. Oh, you can still argue that email isn't subject to the law. Well, the law caught up with it. Um, and the DAs, except for that one holdout, um, also wound up there even before the law changed. So social media creates this new risk of violation of the open meeting law. Um, Let's talk about two, well, let's talk about three different types of social media. The first is the town social media. So town sponsored, town pages um, run by a staff person. That person can post whatever they think they need to in accordance with the applicable policy. Okay, they're responsible for managing that social media site. Board members have to be careful if they post on that site for a couple reasons. One is the open meeting law. We don't want to get to a quorum of members saying something or talking about something that they should actually be talking about at a posted meeting. But the other thing is, is that sometimes it sends out the wrong impression about what the answer is. And one of the towns um, that I represent, uh, a DPW superintendent posted something, and then one selectman jumped on and said, no, let me clarify, and then another selectman jumped on and said, you both have it wrong, and then a third one did, and then a fourth one did, and by the time it was done, they thought that one road was going to be closed, but it wasn't, and it caused this huge thing because they all needed to get to, I mean, not a play, but a thing at the high school. So, you know, that can cause problems because individual members of a board only have the authority that the board gives to them. So that first selectman in my example that jumped on had no authority to counter or to contradict the DPW superintendent. What should he have done? He should have called the DPW superintendent and said, hey, I have a question about that. Or called the town manager and said, hey, you give that DPW superintendent a call right now because I think what he put up there was wrong. He didn't have the right to represent the board. And the other board members, when they jumped in, they also were kind of making a bad situation worse. OK? 
okay? So that's another risk. Now, the town's um, social media, in most cases, um, if the board and committee members stay off of it, will not create open meeting law issues, okay? Could create a public records issue. Are we keeping records of those, of those posts? Um, now we go to individual social media. So um, an individual could have two types of social media. They could have their personal social media, and then they could have an official social media. A lot of people, when they're running for office, will have a campaign social media page. Um, when I talk about this, I'm reminded of one selectman who is very, very uh, emphatic in, in her campaign about what she was going to do to help build affordable housing. And her entire campaign page was, a, was dedicated to affordable housing, how, how to do it, how to achieve it, um, what the naysayers said that were wrong, and um, all the reasons why she was going to approve all sorts of things when she was elected. And then she was elected. She's like, what am I going to do with this page? Because now it looks like I've prejudged every single 40B and every single other affordable housing opportunity that I'm going to just, you know, be in favor of that. She's like, you know, I understand I have to make a decision based on what's front, in front of me. Um, so what she did is she used her, her campaign page after that only for informational purposes. So she only posted things that other people sent to her that would be relevant to affordable housing generally. No more about stuff happening in the town and now just kind of like a general resource on affordable housing. And then she had her kind of active selectman page. And on her active selectman page, she really used that to give people insight into what the board was doing. So on her page, she would say, the board's meeting at whatever, here's the agenda. Or she'd say, if you're interested in affordable housing, come to our meeting on Wednesday where we'll be talking about blah. So rather than go back and forth with people about her opinions, she used it as a resource for people. Um, and people did post on her page. They posted things on her page that raised questions, that challenged her. And at the beginning, she was replying to all of those with her explanation, explanation, explanation. But what was happening is that that was raising issues when she got into public hearings. And anybody who does land use stuff or who's dealing with adjudicating um, uh, people's rights, it's really important to look like you haven't prejudged something and also to look like you're going to make a decision based on what's in front of you. So um, she wound up having a, a very good talk um, with the manager and a few other people about how it really would just be better to say to the people that were posting on her page, thank you for your input. Because that recognized and, and respected the fact that they had taken time to provide their feelings, ideas, beliefs, and concerns, but she wasn't engaging in a, in a back and forth about those at that time, okay? So uh, there's also a city councilor, and I, I'll see if I can remember her name and send it to Paul, who um, has a page very much like that. One thing that she decided she would do is she would post her reasoning for decisions after she made them. So she did the thank you for your input thing beforehand, but after the board vote and she had a, a public discussion of her you know, feelings, ideas, beliefs, and concerns, then she would post about what her rationale was. Um, she also did something, uh, a call-in. She, uh, she's a working mom, and she would basically have time, I think, between 9 and 11 at night once a week where people could call into her, um, into her, you know, like a web service and have a conversation about things that were going on in town. Um, and so, and she would do that. It, was, it would be, uh, you know, public so anybody could see whoever she answered that other people could listen and they could call in with questions. But again, she wouldn't get into a back and forth about things that were ongoing. But someone might say, oh, my road really needs to be plowed. And she would say, you know, here's what we're doing with roads. And she tried to explain all the things that were going on in town with roads. Now, that's good uses of social media. It's easy to see that we're not talking about violating the open meeting or public records or conflict of interest law because essentially it's being used as a vehicle to provide information to the public. There are riskier ways to operate, however, and essentially what the AG has said um, is that Facebook I'm very familiar with on Instagram. I'm not very familiar with Snapchat, so I'm not going to talk about Snapchat. Um, but on Facebook, people are your friends, right? You meet them or you friend each other and then they are in your circle. 
And so if you and all your board members are in some of the same circles, how do you deal with that? Well, one thing you cannot do is call them out directly. So you can't say, right at so-and-so and have, you know, have them be called out in your comments if they're, on your, if they're members of your board. You also wouldn't tag yourself as being with them if you're posting a comment about something that's going on present. Okay, so you don't direct any comments to other people on your board. Now, from a purely lawyerly conservative perspective, in my view, if you see a couple people have weighed in from your board on a particular matter, don't jump on the bandwagon, okay? Because now it's gonna create the opportunity for a violation of the open meeting law. And or it's gonna raise questions or raise concerns from members of the public about what you're doing, right? Even if it's not a technical violation because it's less than a quorum, it still could raise questions. Um, for this, my feeling, and, and a lot of people have said to me, you know, that's really idealistic, Lauren, because yeah, sure, you know, you can say you shouldn't jump in on that, but if everyone's talking about whether dogs should be on a leash, and I don't say anything, they're gonna say, well, what do we elect you for if you have nothing to say about this? So one of the things that we talk about is weighing in by saying, um, I appreciate everyone's comments and concerns about this. The board is talking about this on Wednesday. Please come to the meeting. So now you've shown you're responsive. You're not ignoring it. Or you can even say, because of the open meeting law, I'm not gonna post my own opinions here today, but I'd be happy to discuss it with you offline or if you'd like to come to the meeting on Wednesday. Um, that way you look responsive, you look participatory, but you're not putting yourself or the board at risk. Okay, um, it's almost, it's, it's a, just one second, it's almost a reaction type thing because we are programmed to react. So it's really to give yourself a few seconds to say, do I actually have to post here? Like, could I say something else? Could I just say, this is a very interesting discussion or I'm glad so many people are participating in this or something that doesn't put you or your committee or your count, the council at risk, okay? Yes, ma'am. Well, but if you say to somebody, I'd be happy to discuss it with you offline, yep. don't you then run the danger that that offline conversation could be shared by the person you're talking with? You do, you do. So it depends who it is and what the circumstances are. You're right, because one of the things that we often see actually is obviously inadvertent violations of the law where a constituent emails a full council or a full committee with a question or a complaint or a concern. And then somebody on the board or committee thinks they're being helpful mm -hmm. and they reply to all, right? Including the, the requester because they don't wanna make it look like, they don't wanna reply and then have 19 other replies, you know, all saying different things. So they reply um, and that creates a violation of the open meeting law. Because now you're sharing your ideas, feelings, beliefs, and concerns with a quorum. Even though it didn't violate the open meeting law for the person to send the email, it violates the open meeting law to send it back. So as part of my normal presentation, I say, and I'm going to say it now, uh, treat that reply to all button like it doesn't exist. It's bad. Okay? It creates risk. It leaves you exposed in ways you can't necessarily realize right at the moment. Um, if you feel like you need to respond to somebody or something, uh, about, about an email that's copied to all the council, you send it to a staff person if you can, or if it really needs to be another member, especially with a bigger, a bigger group, then just to one person, but not, not to reply to all, okay? If you have a three-member board, you can't talk about anything outside of a meeting, for real, because that's then a violation, a quorum automatically, okay? Oh, sorry, yes. With respect to the staff, um, Facebook page, so could there be topics that we can like and, for example, we had the She Leads Amherst um, hashtag, and so I share the photo album and then other town councilors like that, so. What? Right. It's not a perfect scenario because a lot of these things aren't black and white even when we'd like them to be black and white. Um, sharing a photo and then other people liking it is probably fine. Um, if it's a matter within the jurisdiction of the council, and I don't know, I, it's like hard for me to think of an example, but I, I, in another one of the towns that we represent, they had a llama problem, okay? And so if a selectman had posted a llama and the, all the other selectmen liked it, I think you could start, you could at least make the argument 
that really they were talking about that issue. Um, so you need to be thoughtful about what you're doing on social media. That's really what it comes down to. What should you definitely not do? Um, in my view, you should definitely not get in a deliberation, I'm using the word differently here, um, with constituents about matters that are or will be pending. Because that then is, is now let's just, I, I don't mean like generally, affordable housing you know, topic or uh, open space, I mean specifically. If you know something is gonna be before your board, you shouldn't be on social media writing down your exact opinions, feelings, ideas, and beliefs. Someone could write to you and share theirs. That's fine. But you don't want to say, I completely agree, I intend to vote no, blah, blah, blah. Even though we're kind of used to that. You know, we're used to it. But that's a record, and it's there, and if there's a problem, someone's going to take it out and submit it at a voter registration hearing or submit it at a whatever hearing. Yes? I shared um, my um, how I was going to vote on something. So is that, am I facing a risk for that because I shared with a constituent what I was going to do? Um, th these are not black and white issues the way that I, I'm talking about them like they're black and white. But there's a lot of shades of gray for this kind of thing. Um, you can talk about about whatever, I mean, you have the ability to talk about anything that you want. You can share how you're going to vote. You can do any of that. But when you come to the table to make decisions, I think it's important, especially if you've been vocal outside the room, to say, I'm here. You know, Many of you know I've always been a fan of whatever it is. Um, but of course, I will only make my decision tonight after I've heard all the evidence and have had the opportunity to ask questions to the appropriate people. Um, you know, again, now that's more of a perception thing than it is an open meeting law thing at all, okay? And, and because that's just, what are people thinking about how you're, you're, the choices you're making? And especially if it's an adjudication, like a liquor license or something, although you have, you have a commission, right? Um, but let's just say hypothetically, when you're adjudicating rights, it's imperative that you're relying on what's in front of you in evidence. So if it's anything like that, just make that quick disclosure. Just say, you know, you've, people have heard me talk about this. They know I'm generally a fan of this, or they know that I'm inclined to say yes, but of course I wouldn't make a decision without listening to everything here tonight and asking the right questions. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, I am part of the town's housing trust as part of the bylaw creating the trust, which follows the state law, I believe. We have had a member of the town select board on the trust, and we will have a member of the town council on the trust. Looking back, the town council members who have been part of the trust have contributed valuable ideas, information, advice in meetings. Sorry, is there any problem with that in the future? Um, so just to recap what the question was, um, you have a municipal affordable housing trust, and uh, it's actually required by law that there be a selectman or a member of the council on the trust. And um, as a result, I think the law is anticipating that that person is going to participate in a significant way and help to come up with ideas and make decisions. There's nothing that prohibits anybody from coming up with ideas and helping to make decisions, um, even if, let's say, that uh, the Affordable Housing Trust and the council are going to, you know, the council is going to appropriate some money over that. That's still okay. That that councilor was doing their job by participating as a member of their trust, and they're on the trust because they're a council. So they're they're actually they have a they do have a fiduciary duty to the trust, but it stems from their position as a councilor. That's fine. Same thing with the CPA. I think this comes up all the time, or the CPA committee. Um, you know, we see. Uh, people very concerned and worried, oh, well, that member of the Historic Commission is on the CPC or the CPAC, and when this matter comes before um, the Historic Commission, they have a conflict. Or when the Historic Commission requests for funds to rehabilitate something comes before this, the CPAC, there's a conflict. No, there's not. The idea is that those people are participating as members of the CPAC because of their experience because they're on the committee. They're supposed to be bringing that background and that perspective with them, so it's okay. Yes. So 
<clears throat> this is a topic that's come up. When that person is there, if the council has not discussed the issue or voted on an issue, who are they speaking on behalf of? Um, that is a wonderful question. And this is a lawyer answer. No, okay. um, th there is, it is a fine line because they are not, they are designated to serve on the committee by the members of their committee and let's say historic or, so they're designated, but they're not, a rep they're not representing that entity. Meaning, let's just say the selectman in a town think X, but the individual selectman thinks Y, and the individual selectman, when they go to the Community Preservation Act committee meeting, votes in accordance with how they feel, which is whatever it was, Y. Um, that's their prerogative and that's their perspective. If and when it comes to the Board of Selectmen to put it onto the warrant, then it's up to the board to make a decision. Do we want to put this on or not? And maybe the board says no, because we as a group vote you know, five to one uh, to reject that, uh, that application or that concept. We're not willing to put it on without the right number of signatures. Okay, so, it, but there are variances. It does, it does sometimes matter. If the council, for example, takes a vote and authorizes you to represent it at a CPAC meeting, then you are representing the council at the meeting. If you just go to the meeting, but you haven't been designated, then there's a difference. You can speak about what the committee has done or the council has done or believes or thinks, but it's different than you putting your hand up and saying, I'm here on behalf of. Does that make sense? Okay. I'm, I, I have to push you further yeah. because we do I told you have, I feel like I'm on jeopardy. We do have people uh, we do have councillors that by virtue of a vote of the council represent us on certain bodies, okay? So based on what you're saying, when they go to that body representing us, if we have elected them, then they are speaking on our behalf. It depends. I, I knew it depends. This. Yeah, it depends. I went to that it, same school. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, in some circumstances, it may be that you're actually designating someone to represent the position of the council at a particular thing or with respect to a particular thing. At a, in another circumstance, you're just selecting someone to essentially be a part of that other group because they're a counselor. So they're not going with any formal direction. They're not being told the council's point of view. They're not being told to represent the council's point of view. They're told, being told to be present kind of as a liaison for the council so that that individual knows what's going on and then there can be a back and a forth. Yes, ma'am. I can't let that go. I've stumbled into something I can tell. Yeah, you really have because in Amherst, we don't just randomly assign counselors or formerly select board members to go be something. We assign specifically people to go to our Joint Capital Planning Committee, and we expect them as counselors to serve on the Joint Capital Planning Committee and communicate information back and forth. The way, what I just heard described sounds a lot like what has been very ineffective representation by groups from the, now the council, the library trustees, or the school committee people who say, oh, they just selected me to be there. No, they didn't select you just to be there. They selected you to be a conduit. So how can we make that clearer? It's one thing for us to say it at town council, but how can we make that clearer that that's true for all these bodies, that we're not just saying, oh, you're representative of counselors. No, you're representing the council's views back and forth. Um, so I appreciate the distinction, and I agree there are different types of representation. And I think that's really what we're talking about right now. Um, I think the council, if it's, this is a council issue, the council when making the selection would specify. We are asking you to go and represent the council's position. The council voted you know, five to four to do whatever uh, with however many abstaining. And um, this is the position you're going to go and take. But there's other times, like the Community Preservation Committee is one of them. A, a, a member of the Community Preservation Committee is designated by their body to go there. It's, it doesn't say to represent. It says a member is designated. So the idea is that the Community Preservation Committee is its own thing, is its own entity. So someone who's on the Community Preservation Committee might very well be supportive of a particular project, 
that the council isn't. Now, as you suggested, or you know, whatever, the historic commission or the planning board, as you suggested, they're not gonna be doing a very good service for their board or committee if they don't say to the, to the, CP, the CPAC in this example, look, I'm really for that, but I know the four other members of my board are not. You don't have to vote the way the four other members of your board would vote though, but it wouldn't be responsible to just go and not tell them and be like, oh yeah, the planning board, we're all for that, I'm for that, because that doesn't, that doesn't convey what needs to be conveyed. So there's a difference between being a legal representative of or being a formal representative of the position of the body. And there are times, like, you might vote to send, you know, the council president to a conference of council counselors to represent the council and to share the council's perspective, points of view, et cetera. That's different than saying, hey, we'd really like someone to go to this conference. And I think it's because there, there, is, there are two differences I think that you've just really highlighted. One is, of course, the council doesn't sit on the CPAC, so. But for a historical commission rep who does sit on the CPAC, I think it would shock the historical commission to, un, to believe that their historic commission rep isn't supposed to vote the way they think they would. But they don't have the information ahead of time, and that leads to the other problem, which is, for example, our Joint Capital Planning Committee. We're not sending someone to go represent what we decided as a council because we didn't decide anything as a council. They're sitting there together. They're getting the information on behalf of the school committee, the town council, et cetera. It's sort of a subcommittee way of looking at things. And they're going to duke all that out. In their, and then they're going to hopefully come back to the council and say, this is how it's looking, not just randomly vote. Okay. And that's... Yeah, that's, I think that's a good example as well, because in that example, that person is really collecting information. They haven't been designated to act on the council's behalf. That's a different thing. They've been, at, they've been designated to go listen and bring back a report, and then eventually to go back and represent the council's perspective at that. But, but that, that's dependent on what, what kind of part of the process we're in. It depends on the different committees that you're dealing with. And it also, so the, um, the requirement that a single member of, uh, let's say the council or the selectman be on the Affordable Housing Trust. The Affordable Housing Trust, it's its own thing. And so, again, maybe the council isn't supportive of X, Y, or Z, or maybe the, a board of selectmen isn't supportive of that. But the individual who's serving on that committee is. They get to vote how they want. They're on, when they're in that role, they're in their own thing. That's a very legal term. Um, but again, I think it would be irresponsible of that, that selectman, let's say, to not say, look, I feel really strongly about this, but I can tell you that my other board members don't feel like that, and if we go forward with it like this, it's not going to pass. The idea is that you're bringing your expertise to this other, this other enterprise that you're involved with, and that you bring a lot of your, what you know and what you learn there, and you share it back and forth. Now, again, Let's go back, because I think that the issue of representation that I was talking about is important because it does bring up open meeting law things all the time. Let's hypothetically say uh, there's a board of selectmen in a town with a big project, okay? And the planning board is holding a hearing on that project. Two different scenarios. The first scenario, the, the board of selectmen votes to authorize person X to go in and represent the position of the Board of Selectmen to the Planning Board. When that person stands up, they say, I am here as the Chairman of the Planning Board on behalf of the Planning Board. Okay? That person is representing the Planning Board. They've been imbued with the authority of the Planning Board to speak for the Planning Board. That's different than a member of the Board of Selectmen simply coming to the meeting and getting up at the front of the room and saying, you know, my name's Lauren, I am a Selectman, but I'm here as an individual and here's my thoughts on this. And even if I say we've talked about this at the board meeting, but I think blah, 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 I am not representing the board. The board has not authorized me to represent it. I can't represent the board. I could only represent myself. And if I say, you know, the planning board this, the planning board that, or the board of selectmen this, board of selectmen that, I really can't be speaking for them at all. Okay. Well, this is certainly, uh, you know, a turn, a left turn. Um, I'm gonna bring it back to the open meeting law. Um, because I think it's actually a really useful um, uh, um, transition. Under the new law, 
members of a board can go to a meeting of another properly posted board. Okay, under the old law, they cannot do that. And um, I know this for sure. Uh, I had to tell um, one member of a board of selectmen that they need to leave because they had reached a quorum at one of my first meetings in a town when I first started at the firm. And it was very uncomfortable. They like all pulled up a chair and I'm like, uh, no, oh, three of you, one has to leave. Very uncomfortable. That's not the law anymore. The law now allows a board, a quorum of a board to attend another board's properly posted meeting. Um, so this means, let's say, let's, let's just take this, let's say there's a big project and the council's really interested. The council can go as individuals to that other board's meeting. What they can't do is deliberate when they're at that other board's meeting, okay? So, what does that mean? What if I want to say something? I could get up there as an individual if I'm on the council and I can say, I'm here, as you know, I'm a member of the council, but I'm speaking on my own behalf. What I can't do is turn to the other councilors, especially if they're saying together, which I don't recommend, I'll explain after, um, and say, right, don't you agree? Because by saying, right, don't you agree, now I'm deliberating. I'm asking a quorum of members to tell me how they feel, think, believe, etc., and they haven't posted. So my suggestion always is in this circumstance, if your board is chatty, that's also a legal term, post a meeting at the same time. So that if, in fact, someone gets up and they say, you know, I'm a member of the board, right? Don't you think? Isn't this really important? Because when I do that, that's an open meeting law issue. Now we have a quorum deliberating at this meeting, but if we've posted it, it's not a violation of anything, okay? And if, in fact, we don't deliberate, fine. Um, what are some other things to think about? Don't all sit together at that meeting. No whispering. Whispering looks really bad. Um, the DAs did not like whispering, and neither does the AG. I know, I, I feel a little bit like a kindergarten teacher right now, and I'm sorry about that. Um, but you don't want to make it look like you're violating the law. So if, you know, if you're a five-member board and three of you are sitting here and you're all then people are gonna think, oh, well, they're talking about what's going on, and they shouldn't be. So um, don't sit together, don't talk to each other, uh, don't drive together if you can avoid it. Um, now sometimes people are like, that's crazy, we have a meeting in Lakeville, and we're coming from, you know, I don't know, Hyannis, like, of course we're gonna drive together. Okay, I get it, but if you can not, then don't. Um, what about social gatherings? I mean, we're at social media, what about social gatherings? Um, again, under the new law, there's an exception for people that wind up at a social gathering where there's a quorum of their board members, um, but they're not supposed to deliberate when they're doing that. So um, the example I like to give, because it's a real one, and it, I thought it was really funny, and I observed it in a town where I don't represent anyone, so it wasn't my problem, which was good. Um, I walk by the kitchen, and there are like all these people chit-chatting around the table. And I look over there, I'm like, oh, that's a cozy bunch. And the guy who, uh, whose house I was at looks at me and he goes, oh my God, that's a conservation commission, every single one of them. Now, I immediately went to the game of Clue. It's a conservation commission in the kitchen with a knife. Um, but it looked horrible. And as it turned out, they were dealing with a really horrible situation in general. They had an application before them. So whether they had been talking about that or not, everybody at that party thought they were. You can bet that Monday morning they had open meeting law violations filed against them, okay? So that's something you want to think about. If you do find yourself at a party, um, it's hard to schedule a kind of meet and greet, like let's get to know each other, because the risk of matters coming up that relate to your official business um, exists. Um, so sometimes, sometimes we'll do a retreat. They will try to do a selectman retreat or a council retreat, but it's a lot of work for everybody to kind of stick to the straight and narrow and not to talk about stuff that's ongoing. So, you know, if, if there's thoughts about doing stuff, and I know that you guys have in the past, and there's ideas about, um, about how to kind of build relationships, and, and that's important. Team building is exceptionally important. But it's also important to remember that you have to stick to the straight and narrow. Um, as I say with the open meeting law, I always think you do better to assume that people are gonna think the worst because then it's easier to know what to do. If you're assuming that people are thinking you're doing something bad, then you know better what not to do. Yes? Could, could be for example. Comedian on the weekend. 
<laughs> could we, for example, organize a dance Zumba party for the council and announce it as a public meeting? You can have anyone you want to at any meeting you would like. So yes, if you post a meeting for a training or a retreat or a Zumba party, you may do so. But don't invite Paul, because I hear he likes to dance. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was a joke. Okay, yes sir. If they post that Zumba party, do they have to have minutes for that? Yes, they do. Okay. Um, every meeting of a board or committee has to have minutes. So if you double post, if you post, if the council's gonna go to the planning board meeting or the planning board's gonna go to the council meeting, both groups need to post. What's it mean to post? Time, place, date, and then enough specificity so that they know what's gonna happen at the meeting. Now, if you're posting to attend someone else's meeting, you can use their agenda as your agenda. And you can use their minutes as your minutes if you want to. You know, although board members didn't participate in the deliberation, this is what occurred at the meeting. And that's fine. Yes, ma'am. But I want to know what needs to be reported in one's own minutes. Okay. What needs to be included in one's own minutes? All right, so that's a, believe it or not, that's a question that is multiple issues. Um, only the minute taker is required to take a minutes that would meet the requirements of the open meeting law. Individual board and committee members who are not the designated minute taker can take their own notes in whatever form they want. And as long as they don't share them with anyone else, they are not public records subject to mandatory disclosure. If you are the minute taker, then the notes you take are public records from the moment of their creation what needs to be in them? Time, date, place, people present, people absent, any motions made and votes taken, as well as enough additional detail to let someone who isn't at the meeting know what happened at the meeting. So it used to be that it was just enough to do a very quick summary, okay? If we use this kind of, um, which is not a meeting in a traditional sense, but let's say I attend a Board of Selectmen meeting where 20 minutes of their time is me giving a talk about the new short-term rental law, and then the rest of it is their own meeting. And three people ask me questions during that discussion. Really, the AG would like to see my kind of general outline of what I said and the three questions and what I answered. Now, that is a significant burden. It is significant. Okay, it used to not be that. It used to be Attorney Goldberg presented on the short-term affordable housing law. Questions were asked and answered. That was good enough. Under the new law, there needs to be more detail. Okay, um, so this idea of, and I, it's a theme that we've been talking about that the law applies broadly, that the law is intended to cast a wide net, that its application is, uh, or interpretation is broad. It's all on purpose. That's how the AG, as the enforcing authority, sees it, that it's meant to have a far reach. It's meant to require discussions amongst a quorum to happen at the table, even if those conversations are uncomfortable, because you don't know how everyone else there feels. And normally when we go into something, especially in our private world, private sector world, you go in, you're prepared. You've done the research. You know, you've, you've tested the waters with all the people that are gonna be the decision makers, and you come prepared. Um, I have two water and superintendents in one town that I do an open meeting law training at every year. And they're both engineers, not superintendents, commissioners, and they're both engineers. And every year they ask me the same question. Are you seriously telling me I am gonna come in and be as unprepared as if I didn't even know what this project was about? Is that what you're telling me? And I'm like, well, you can read whatever's provided to you ahead of time, but I can't talk to Joe. You can't talk to Joe, three member board. It's frustrating because you're supposed to have your reactions, your feelings, your ideas, and your beliefs be at the table. Yes, in the back and then. And then. Um, imagine you have a nine member board. Hypothetically. Hypothetically, you have a nine member board and as chair you manage to talk members into participating in three person subcommittees. Mm -hmm. Do those subcommittee meetings need to be posted and have minutes? Yes. Yeah. 
I, I want to stay on the minutes uh, a bit, um, partly because we're all taking our own minutes. Uh, we don't have minute takers. Okay, I, I want to stay on the minutes question. So um, if the specificity has to be what were the questions asked, do we have to do Lynn asked a question, Kathy asked a question, and then uh, can, so that kind of specificity, who, well, who was the voice doing the asking? And suppose we're, um, I'll give you another example of, we're talking through a set of ideas on, do you like this or that? And someone makes this suggestion, someone makes that. Can we summarize with the following ideas were suggested, list the ideas, or do we have to identify the offer of each? Knowing that we also have a camera going. We're also taping it. And then sometimes not. So um, it is acceptable and allowable to use a videotape or an audio tape to help create a, acceptable minutes. Um, basically, the law says you're not required to keep a transcript. So it doesn't have to be, she said this, she said this, she said this, he said that. Film. But it has to be enough for someone who wasn't there to know what happened at the meeting. Now, I can give you an example of this because the Attorney General issued a 17-page decision um, dealing with a cert the search by the um, UMass Board of Trustees for a chancellor. I don't know if you remember this. Um, and um, the, in academia, yes. your reputation is very well known, and so you have to be careful about the kind of information you allow to be in the public realm about applicants or they'll, they'll automatically know. And this is what they told me, because I'm not in that world. Um, and so they, in their minutes, they didn't include anything about the qualifications. They didn't include anything about prior experience. They just said the candidate told us about his private, prior experience, or the candidate told us about her private experience, our past experience. And the AG basically said, no, you need to put that in the minutes. And if you choose to, you can redact it under the public records law, but it goes in the minutes. So. And they, they wanted every question that was asked and, and the response that was given. Now, that was an interview, so that's a little bit different than a regular discussion. But in my experience, it would be, if, if you're having a roundtable discussion about something and everyone has something to say, and they talk multiple times, I don't think you have to have it written down that every single person spoke multiple times. They don't, you have to write that individual one. But you can say, you know, um, person X was very supportive of this concept, Person Y felt uh, concerned about the position uh, that, uh, that this would suggest for the future and was, you know, hoping that we would, you know, consider more options, person, whatever. And if they said that four different times in four different ways, you don't have to write it down four different times, four different ways. But enough so that someone gets a flavor of the discussion, even if they weren't there. Sorry, Lauren, I said I wouldn't come today, and here I am. I know that you have to give us the proper legal advice. I have to say, realistically, it's insane to imagine that volunteers are going to say, Lynn wondered about this. Alyssa thought it was a better idea to combine these two ideas. Kathy said, I have been through those meetings with those kinds of minutes, and everyone argues about how they were characterized, et cetera. Surely we can go with something that's more along the lines of bullet points, et cetera, until someone says we're not being clear enough. I think it's more the ideas than who said it. Um, so one thing that you missed when we started out was the concept of best practices versus what is reality. And I understand it's very difficult to, I mean, I find it's very difficult to meet the Attorney General standards. Um, you know, I spend a good deal of time every day looking at sets of minutes that the Attorney General has found are not satisfactory. Um, so I, I understand. I think you have to do it the way that you can that is as close to correct as possible. One of the things that I have been suggesting to people, especially if they are the minute takers, is that they set up their minutes before the meeting using the agenda that's been prepared, okay? And that as they do that, they can leave, they can put everybody's name down and then when that person's speaking and they feel like it's important, they can type that in right there. Um, if a person takes notes by hand, it's a little harder. But if they're, if they're note takers by, by computer, it's a little bit easier. Um, 
Also, if you know what the big issues are ahead of time, you know, like I think of town meeting, right? Someone always gets up and says it's for the children. Someone always gets up and says, I'm on a fixed income, right? Those are, those are two uh, alternative arguments. So you know someone's gonna make those arguments. You could write it down and then fill it in later. <laughs> No. <laughs> the, you're supposed to, in, in, the, the, the kind of best practice is to have someone who wasn't there understand what happened at the meeting. So let's just say you were really supportive of a particular idea. The AG would say, for me to really understand what happened at the meeting, it would be better if I knew that you said it versus someone else. But I understand, you know, not everything is going to meet that level. So it's a matter of, of making sure that somebody who's not at the meeting can understand. That's the standard you're working towards, that they understand what happens at the meeting. If it doesn't, I mean, I, I think a transcript is so-and-so said this, so-and-so said that, so-and-so said that, and I'm not suggesting at all that a transcript is required, okay? That is not required. It specifically says it in the law. And I'm going to remind you as well that there's a difference between talking about what a best practice might be and what's defensible, and appropriately so, if a challenge is brought. So. Um, you know, a lot of times making sure that you're trying to hit the mark matters as much as actually hitting it. So understanding that you're trying to create a record that allows somebody who wasn't there to get the basic feel for what. Yes? So, I'm sorry. So with minutes, one of the things I think the council has talked about in our particular committees is, so we're trying really hard to make sure that we do minutes the right way. But I, another thing that's come up is maybe audio recording all of our meetings that makes it easier. Is that good, bad? Um, audio recordings are great and you can use them to prepare the minutes. But you do need to have actual minutes. I, this is one of those things, it's a relic. It's a relic of the law because it's hard to argue that an audio tape or a videotape of a meeting isn't better than someone else interpreting what happened at the meeting. I mean, I think all of us can agree on that. When this law was originally written, there, that capability didn't exist, and or, you know, not everybody had a tape player, so they were entitled to get the records. Um, the law is moving, and I think it will move, it will continue to move. There's open meeting law propose, amendment proposals every single solitary year, not just one, not just two, usually 10, 15, 20. They don't usually get any traction, but when there's enough to push it, then something changes. So I think we'll see a change on that. In the meantime, if you have the audio recording and you're not a person that does well with typing as you go, then don't bother. Don't type as you go. Use the audio recording later to help you make the minutes, and that's fine. Um, until those draft minutes are prepared, the audio tape or the, is the minutes of the meeting, and if a public records request comes in, that's what's responsive to it, okay? Yes. So to clarify, it would be you, what we were, what people were thinking is it'd be a way to have a, a backup, not in place of written minutes, but as a backup, and then finding out whether or not, like how those would be posted, because they still would be a public record. Um, that, that makes sense. Um, I will say, uh, when, under the old law, I used to tell people, just write a summary. Don't write down what this person said and what that person said, because what you will wind up spending your time on is, I spoke for 20 minutes, she spoke for three, she has a paragraph, I have a sentence. You know, I thought what I said was so important and what she said was just a passing comment. This is really tough. So to the extent you can get away from that, and if you feel yourself doing that when you're looking at minutes, you're not focused on the right thing, um, focus instead on what the substance of the conversation was and whether that's properly reflected. Okay, now sometimes people have different perspectives, we know that, and then having that backup tape, someone can just be told, that's fine, we also have the tape, they can go listen to the tape if they want to. But you do need actual minutes prepared, okay? Um, if you're using a tape to create minutes, you can destroy the tape when the minutes are approved. If you're using your draft notes as the, the meeting minutes, they're public records as of the moment of their creation, and you can destroy them after they've been approved by the body, unless a public records request is received in the meantime. So I'm gonna um, give you the warning that I give to all people that take minutes. Do not 
write anything there you are not comfortable with other people seeing. No impressions, no comments on people's outfits, no annoyance about how much time something's taking. Because if someone makes a public records request for that, it's public record. And you can only redact something from it if there was a reason to, and those are not good reasons. Okay? So if you're the minute taker, assume your minutes are going to be read. Now what if you make, if someone makes a request and they're messy, or they're incomplete, or you, know, you really do believe that you were like really focused on what one person said about dogs because you love dogs, but you weren't listening to what the dog hater said because you were like, ah, I don't care about that opinion. You know, you're going to go back later and you're going to look at it and say, all right, I want to make sure I'm balanced here. This was a long part of the conversation or whatever. But your initial draft doesn't do that. That's okay. It is what it is. You're going to write the, big, the word draft on the top of that, um, those minutes. You're going to put the date on them and you're going to put it on every single side. If you have multiple sides, you're going to put it on every side so that it's clear with your initials. So if someone then later says, look at these things. This is completely misrepresenting the dog conversation. The answer is, this is representing, this was my minutes the night of. You can see the date and the time I gave them to you. And after that, I watched the video or I went back and refined. And now the minutes are the minutes that were approved by the body. Okay? All right. Um, someone did once ask me, well, what if I do best in doing a shorthand? There's nothing that says you the draft minutes have to be in, you know, readable text. And... For example, if I was to take the draft minutes and I had to write them, no one in this room could read them, and it wouldn't be because they were not in English, it would be because I am a terrible hand writer. So that's not the issue. The issue is, are they prepared, do they exist? If they do, they're subject to disclosure, okay? Um, what else? Anything else? Open meeting laws? Also a legal term. Sorry if you covered this earlier, Lauren. In terms of the, and then just say, go back to the tape. Um, minutes approval, did you have that conversation? Because we were having that conversation recently about the fact that the FAQ says you can do it a variety of ways. Somebody was worried that that meant we should have to vote that we're gonna do it a certain way or not. And it's like, no, let's just pick a way that works for any individual group because a lot of these groups do have a staff person. A lot of town council groups and some of the other town committees don't have a staff person and have to rotate it. So it's not even like one person is always doing the minutes and so they don't get in habits. Um, that's a, a good question. The AG recently released that FAQ on how to approve minutes. Before, it was assumed that the only way to approve minutes was by vote of the entire body. Um, and a lot of times people say to me, well, I wasn't even on the board when that happened, so I can't vote. Well, that's actually not true. You're not attesting to the validity or the, the facts in the minutes. You're just saying these are a record of that meeting. So um, you can participate even if you're not there, especially if you need it for a quorum. Um, to approve. Number two, um, it does not require a vote of the body any longer to approve minutes. A body can approve minutes in a number of ways. One is the traditional way, vote of the body. Another is through the consent calendar concept, which is at the end of the, the meeting notice, you'd have three sets of minutes, for example, that you might be seeking approval of. And unless anyone brings it up at the meeting, it is deemed to be approved. Okay, that's one. Then the other is to give an individual the authority to approve the minutes. So you don't need to vote on it at all. Now this works best when everyone's on the same page and so, and they like the way the individual takes minutes. When you're shifting minute takers and stuff, that can be harder. Um, but there are some boards that it's just obvious this one person is good at the minutes and they never make changes, but you have to talk about them at every meeting. You don't have to do that if you don't want to. You would vote under that circumstance to give the individual the right to approve the minutes. Yes. So just continuing in that, and it's, it's partly because you're seeing a bunch of people that we keep rotating who's taking the minutes. Yeah. So we're, every time someone's taking the minutes, they're not as much of a as participant. So if you did a draft, you marked it a draft, you sent it around, said, anyone have any changes, additions, anything? and people say, looks okay. Is that approval or do you need to have said, uh, say, looks okay to X, Y, you know, here's the person. 
So um, this is one of those times when I really wish I was the writer of laws and not the interpreter, the unofficial interpreter of laws. In the most strict sense, if you're the person that created the minutes and you're a member of the board, you're not supposed to share that amongst a quorum and get feedback from a quorum because that raises to the level of an open meeting law deliberation because if the body has jurisdiction to approve, then now you've created that problem. Um, if you have a staff person, it's completely different. The staff person prepares the minutes, sends it out, says, please get back to me with your feedback. Do not reply to all. No problem at all. Individuals can all write back. And there's a couple decisions from the AG's office. Paul, I'll send them along to you so you can distribute. Um, that suggest that you cannot coordinate outside of a meeting approval of minutes. Oh, absolutely, but that's different than saying, I'm gonna send the minutes around and get everyone's feedback and then everybody provides feedback. Yes, if, you, if at a meeting you guys agree, this person is gonna be the minute taker and this person is gonna be the minute approver, fine, you're done. They're not doing it together. They're not collaborating. Each of them have a different job, right? One person is approving them, one person is writing them. Not being authorized to act together. Sorry. Can, if the council in their own rules of procedure would prefer one method to another. Is that an appropriate thing for a council to do? I, I would say so, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Yes. I just want to clarify. So, so the, if the individual who's taking the minutes is getting if the individual who's taking the minutes and then sends and has sent them out is the only recipient for comments, that too is a problem. It can be, yes. Okay. Um, the, the AG says you can't collaborate on the minutes. So let's say you're just sending them back to one person, but that one person then in, puts everything together and sends it back out and says, here are the minutes. Now that's a violation. Everyone's ideas, beliefs, concerns, opinions have been incorporated and put in there. I will send you those two um, decisions. The, the, the best case scenario is to have a non-board or committee member take the minutes. And for those boards that when you can't, and there's an individual member, just if you have one person who's responsible for approving the minutes, then that one person can just you know, prepare them and approve them and you're done. Um, or you could do the consent calendar way, which is you send them out, and unless someone brings it up, you know, as part of the, um, the meeting, then they're just approved in the form that they were in. Yes. So if you're having a particularly contentious issue under discussion, and you had it at the last, this is ongoing, but you had it at the last meeting, somebody wrote up the minutes, they come, there's a big discussion at the current meeting yeah. of the inadequacy of these terrible minutes. Yes. Do you have to record that debate in the next set of minutes? Yeah. Oh, good grief. So I just want to, um, consent calendar might work for some of our situations. So on, on the consent calendar, each of the members would have had to see a draft of the minutes. So, so, so no feedback. And so you, so you sit down and you said, you've all seen a draft of the minutes. Do we have a yes, yay or no? So, you know, is, is, are there any objections? And otherwise, yeah. we're good to go. So it's not a vote on each of them. Do any of these restrictions tend to have a chilling effect on conversation? Wow, that's, that's a question. I don't know, how much time do we have? Are we gonna have some time here? Um, I think the new law changes the way that, and, and I say new, but it's really been nine years, but people are still, they were doing it a lot you know, longer a different way. Um, I think it's intended to have somewhat of a chilling effect in that the ideas of what's going to be discussed is intended to be listed on that agenda. Whereas before, it could kind of be this free-ranging thing. There was never any requirement that it be about that. 
But we didn't talk about this, which is what if someone brings up something that's not on the agenda and can it be discussed and can it be voted on? And the answer is it can be brought up as long and discussed as long as the chairperson didn't reasonably anticipate it. If the chairperson reasonably anticipated it and left it off the agenda on purpose, then it would violate the open meeting law to discuss it. If the chairperson didn't anticipate it, then it can be discussed and it can even be voted. The issue being that if it's not something that requires immediate attention, is it better, and now I'm layering on this idea from the Attorney General, to put it off to the next meeting where it can appear as a properly posted, scheduled item for discussion so that other people who might be interested in this topic who didn't happen to come that night have an opportunity. So again, it's not required by law. The AG says if the chair didn't anticipate it, doesn't have to be on the notice, can still be discussed, but they recommend that unless it requires immediate action, it be pushed off to the next meeting. I wasn't, that I get, but suppose there's a, it's the difference between recording a vote and having a discussion which is then recorded and entered into the public record. So if you know you're going to vote yes or no, you can just sit there and be quiet and say nothing and not be entered into the public record, and you vote. Is this helpful? I don't know. I think you, you could debate these issues all day. I will say this. Um, if there is a very raucous, uh, energetic discussion, Deciding what to put in the minutes matters. Yeah. Um, especially if there's a lot of disagreements, like as you just said, do you have to write down, this person said this awful thing, this person said this awful thing, this person yelled at this person, this person yelled at that person. No, you don't. You can say there's a heated argument or a heated discussion followed. And I will tell you that um, I'm not a huge, uh, you know, I don't go to court all the time. I did go to court on an open meeting law issue once. And the minutes were filled with words that are not appropriate to be in minutes or to be said, really. That happened in an executive session and the recorder recorded literally every single thing people that they said and the judge called me and the other side up and said, who are these people that we're dealing with? And I thought, oh my gosh, I just lost. Because the judge wasn't focused on what they did, you know, what they, whether what they did was something that was okay. They were focused on this open meeting law issue and this yelling at each other issue. So just be thoughtful. You want to put in enough detail so that people have an idea what happened at the meeting. You don't need to put in such detail that it embarrasses someone or it makes it difficult for them or anything like that. Okay. Um, I'm sorry to disrupt this, but um, this room was double scheduled and there's a hearing in here for the Zoning Board of Appeals at six o'clock. So we are going to take a recess and move down to the first floor meeting room and where we can continue this discussion until seven.